Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I am very excited about this this teaching today because I believe you're going to appreciate more than ever before the tremendous amount of gifting God has given you. We're going to be speaking on this subject, discovering your personal kingdom leadership. Please take these notes. I'm going to give you some things to write down very quickly first. And I want to welcome all of our friends joining us around the world on television. Whatever country or nation you're in or city you're in, hotel you're in, we're so glad to have you. God bless you. And thank you so much for joining us on our program today here from the Diplomat Center in Nassau, Bahamas. I want to begin with a couple of statements you can write down, please. The first statement is, the original plan of God was to extend his heavenly kingdom on earth. That was the original plan of God, to extend his heavenly kingdom on earth. This was God's motivation from the beginning. But God set up a program to do that. God wanted to establish a kingdom in the seen world without him coming into the seen world or the visible world. In order to do that, his program was to create from his own self, spirit, a family of offspring who would be just like him, who would be his representatives on the seen world. And they would release, establish, and execute his invisible kingdom in the seen world. This is God's program from the beginning. The Bible is not a difficult book to understand. It has never been the plan of God to establish a religion. As a matter of fact, religion is man-made. The word religion comes from a root word which means to search. So religion is really only necessary if you are lost. Hmm. Before man fell, there was no need for religion. So every activity of man in his attempt to try and find God, whether it is Buddhism, Islam, Confucianism, or whether it is Hinduism, Shintoism, or Baha'i faith, or whether it is Rastafarianism, or Scientology, or Unitarianism, or Atheism, they are all religions because they are all man's attempts to search to find something they believe they lost. Isn't it amazing that God solved the problem himself? Instead of him allowing man to spend the rest of his eternal frustration trying to find God, God made a decision. His decision was, I'm going to make it easy for you. I'll come and discover you. So God's program was never to form a religion. Religion is like an organized club created by man to satisfy his hunger to find God. And we give it different names. I used to be religious. I am not a religious man because I ain't searching no more. Anybody here in that position? Hello, somebody. Religious people haven't found what they're looking for yet. What I have is a relationship now with the one who I walked away from and who I abandoned. 
It was never God's plan, write this down, to have subjects, but sons. And this is a very important statement. It was never God's plan to have subjects, but sons. The reason why this is a difficult statement is because whenever you hear the word king, the next word is subjects. That's not God's plan for us. God is king, but he doesn't want subjects. Thirdly, it has never been God's plan to have Christians. But citizens. God always wanted to have sons who are citizens of his kingdom. What we have done is become something that we created. As a matter of fact, uh, we have basically been tagged by pagans. The word Christian was first introduced in the book of Corinthians by pagans. Pagans named the believers that. And now we've accepted the pagan label and we're playing their game. I used to be a Christian. <laughs> but today, by God, I am a son and a citizen and an ambassador. I like that one. The Bible says we are ambassadors of Christ and heaven. The Bible names us that, but it never names us Christians. The Bible says, as many as believe in him, to them gave he the power to become what? Sons. The Bible names us sons, but never Christians. The Bible says our citizenship is in heaven. The Bible never calls us Christians, but it does call us citizens. To be a Christian, you got to live up to pagans' expectations. To be a son, you got to be like your daddy. Yeah. To be a citizen, you got to represent your country. And to be an ambassador, you got to represent your government. But to be a Christian, you got to measure up to the pagans who named you that. That's why most sinners would say to you, I thought you was a Christian. Because they got their idea of what a Christian is supposed to be. Because they named you that. Tell your neighbor, he talking to you. Tell your neighbor, today I release myself from the burden of being a Christian. I'm going to be a son. Clap your hands and thank God. You delivered now? Delivered. God's simple intent and purpose from the beginning was to extend and establish his kingdom on this earth. And his simple strategy was to rule the seen realm from the unseen realm through the unseen man living in the seen body on the scene. Can you write that down? This statement is probably the most important statement I say all my life. Because this is really the essence of the whole program of God in the Bible. Let me say it again. God's original purpose and intent was to rule the seen, that's the visible world, from the unseen, that's the invisible world, through the unseen, that's the spirit man, living in the seen, that's the body, on the scene, that's the earth. So God wanted to rule the scene from the unseen through the unseen, living in the scene on the scene. Got the scene? <laughs> so how was he going to do that? Well, God who is unseen would put his spirit in the unseen that is living in the scene that is on the scene. And he'd communicate from the unseen to the unseen, living in the scene on the scene, so that the scene could understand what God wants. And whatever God desires, would be related to the unseen, manifested in the scene, on the scene, and therefore the earth will show what heaven is thinking. 
This is God's program. Still is, always is. So what we really have is we have the king of the universe and the invisible world, Elohim, Jehovah Jireh, Adonai, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shishkenu, all the names you want to call him, Almighty God. You get the invisible king, and king is kunig. It means ruler or one who sets standards. The one who sets the standards for all things, he is the king, he is the ruler of the unseen world, and he's the owner of the seen world, and he's living in the unseen. He is invisible, God Almighty. He's the king. Everybody say king. I'm repeating myself for a reason. He's what? The king of everything. He's the king. He's the standard setter. He is the rule establisher. He is the judge of all things. He is the king. You cannot be a king unless there's something to king over. In other words, you can't rule nothing. Are you with me? In order to be a king, you got to have something to rule over, to set standards for. So what God did, before anything was, there was just God, because everything that is was made by God. So God, there was a time when God wasn't king, because there wasn't nothing to be king over. He was just God, Elohim, three in one, by himself. Standing on nothing by the corner of nowhere. And this God, his nature couldn't help itself. Because the first word introducing him in the Bible, the first word that describes him is this word, creator. God doesn't create. He is creator. So creating is a natural result of being a creator. So God created because he is creator. He didn't create so he could become creator. He created because he already was creator. Crea creation and creating was his natural expression. And so God created everything. First the invisible world and then the visible world. And so automatically he became what? King. Because he now has what? Something to rule. Whatever a king rules is called his domain. Everybody say domain. domain. Write the word down. So you got a king, but you got what? A domain. You can't be a king without a domain. You can't be a president without a country. You can't be a prime minister without a nation. So you need something to rule. By the way, that's why Lucifer has a problem. Because he don't own nothing. You all talk to me, man. So he can never be a king. That's why nowhere in the Bible is Satan ever referred to as a king. He's simply an unemployed cherub. So if Satan is ruling your life, that's illegal. If Satan is ruling your finances, or your physical body, or your family, or your home, or your neighborhood, Satan is illegal. You know, it's incredible that God created his own domain. So what do we have now? We have a king with his domain. Everybody say king, king. Domain. domain. Say king domain. King. Say it fast. King. Faster. King. Faster. King. You're good at that, aren't you? The automatic result of a king with a domain is a kingdom man, a kingdom. That's what the whole thing is about. It's about a kingdom, simply the relationship between a king and his domain. 
And the domain includes the seen and the unseen. The Bible says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And therefore, whatever exists, he made it, he created it, and therefore it is his property by right, and therefore it is his rulership domain. So he's the king of all domains. It is his kingdom. And this is the, the, the heart of the whole Bible, the kingdom. Now, look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, if you will. It says, let us make man in our own image and in our likeness, and let them have what? Dominion over what? The fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Do we need to set this up now? We need to? Uh, can we just hold back? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the Word of God says He created you in His what? Image and His likeness to have what? Dominion. Why did God create you? Say it loud. Do you see worship in that verse? Do you see singing in that verse? Oh, how about this one? Do you see heaven in that verse? You were not created for heaven. That's where you came from. God didn't need another rose in his garden. You ever heard that? Matter of fact, we say God kills people because he needs another rose in his garden. God ain't got no garden. And you know, God ain't hot up for people in heaven. The purpose why God created man was very clear. God said, look, I needed somebody to dominate a real estate called earth. That's what I needed. I didn't need nobody in heaven to come sing for me. I got some angels there, but much better than you guys. I don't need to hear no chorus. I need someone to rule for me. Tell your neighbor, this sounding good. You were created to be in charge of a territory. So he says, let us make man, why? To have dominion over what? Fish, birds, read it there, cattle, plants, and everything that is in the earth. So God's plan was to create a creature that would have dominion or rulership over a domain called earth. That's clear to God. It ain't clear to us quite yet, but it's clear to God. And so God is very committed to what he's doing, and every human being was created, therefore, to dominate this planet. So trapped in every one of you is a dominion spirit and a dominion mandate. That's why you go crazy when you are dominated. Now, you're supposed to dominate the plants, the Bible says, the birds. You're supposed to dominate the creatures, the animals, and all that's in the earth. Could you imagine a human who's supposed to dominate a plant being dominated by a plant? Tobacco leaf, cocoa leaf, grape juice. How dare you tell me that you are a man with hair under your arms and big muscle, but a leaf from Colombia runs your life? I'm not impressed at your dignified walk in your high heel shoes and your fancy purse when a piece of leaf from Cuba runs your life. Oh, I appreciate your executive look in your 10-story office and you park your car in the back in the garage and go up in the elevator, but when you get to that big mahogany desk, there's a little bottle in the shelf that runs your life and at 11 o'clock, it calls you, come drink me now, and you bow to that bottle. Could you imagine having your life ran by a tree? Now, I doubt any of you in this setting have your lives being ran by grape juice. Your life is not ruled by 
some leaves from Cuba or some plants from Colombia. I don't think you, you all are more dignified than that. Uh, your lives are run by a more sophisticated tree. See, the saints got another problem with Bush. I heard a lady one time giving a testimony in a church here in the Bahamas, and she said, he woke me up this morning. He started me on my way. He set my feet on a rock to stay, and I want to pray my strength in the Lord. Y'all pray for me. Amen. And Holy Ghost said to me, she lying. This woke her up this morning. This added her on her way. You see, because the Lord said, you know, when it was prayer meeting and it was raining, she didn't go. But when it was raining, it was time to go get work for this. She got up in the rain. Well, it's drafty tonight, you know. I can't go to prayer meeting. But no matter how drafty it is when it's time to go to get the stuff. <laughs> dominated by the thing you're supposed to dominate. No wonder why the first thing that happened in the church when it was born in the book of Acts, the first meeting they had, the first meeting they had, the people came and bought this and threw it on the ground and put it under the apostles' feet. Why? Because that used to rule them. Now they will rule it. You know, you're not supposed to work for money. Money is supposed to work for you. When you work for money, you're poor and you'll stay poor. People who got an understanding of money don't work for money. They let money work for them. If you go after money, money keep running. But if you send money somewhere, it comes back crying in you. That's a revelation. So God gave man dominion over all these things and made him the king of the earth. The word dominate means to govern, to rule, to control, to manage, to lead, to, to have authority over. God gave this man all this awesome stuff. And then man did something dumb. Now let me tell you something, friends. God never gave us ownership. He gave us rulership. Write that down. When somebody gives you uh, ownership, then, you know, they are not responsible anymore. But if they give you rulership, they are still responsible. That's why God set up a qualification. He said, if you obey me and don't touch that tree, you can manage this planet all you want, as long as you want. It's yours. So what God gave man was what I call a management contract of earth. He gave man a lease agreement. The Bible is very clear. It says, the earth is still the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It, it was never yours. He gave it to you to, to manage under a lease agreement called dominion mandate. And therefore, what you do with the planet, you've got to give an account back to the owner. And how you use the planet and what you do with it, you've got to report back and he will judge us according to how we agree to run the planet. Turn with me, if you will, to a scripture that I constantly referred to. It's found in the book of Psalm, Psalm 115. Everybody turn there quickly, please. Tell your neighbor, I was born to rule this place. You know, whenever you see yourself being under control by the earth, you find yourself having high blood pressure, physical problems, because you're not built to be ruled by this earth. Your body rebels against it. Even your physical body become sick when it's under pressure of this earth. Look at Psalm 115. Young people underline this. This thing changed my life as a teenager. I never forgot reading this, and it changed my whole attitude toward myself and toward this planet. Here's what it says in verse 14. May the Lord your God increase both you and your children, and may you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of what? Heaven and earth. Now the next verse is awesome. It says, the highest heavens, that means, the highest means the ones above the, 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 the stratosphere and the hemisphere. We're talking about the, 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 the invisible, uh, the 
the, the, the invisible world where God lives. He says the highest heavens belong to who? To the Lord. But the earth he gave to who? To man. Now the Bible is telling you, you know, directly, look, heaven ain't yours. I'll fly away. God say, where? I don't want you up here. This ain't your territory. <laughs> Let me tell you something. God made arrangements to make sure you never stay in heaven. Because if you ever stay in heaven, God's word would fail. The Bible says, just like the dew falls, and just like the rain falls, so my word goes out of my mouth and comes back without, not without accomplishing what I sent it to do. In other words, if God says he created you to dominate earth, then God is very clear that you cannot stay in heaven. If you do, his word fails. His purpose for creating you was what? Very clear. We ain't got to guess about this to dominate earth. So that's God's word for you. His purpose for you to rule the earth, to dominate the earth. He has no question in his mind about that. So what we have created is a religion of heaven and God has a mandate of earth. Everybody want to go to heaven and God don't want nobody there. So he made arrangements. God made arrangements to make sure whoever dies now will leave heaven and come back. So he made arrangements for your body. It's called the resurrection. So God says the earth belongs to you. He gave that to us. That means that we are the managers, we are the supervisors, we are the rulers, the governors, we are the leaders of the planet. And whatever happens to this planet is our responsibility. That is why God says he can't even loose nothing here or bind anything here because he himself is not authority here. He says whatever you bind on earth, you can't bind nothing in heaven. That ain't your territory. He said whatever you bind on earth is what? Bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, heaven looses. In other words, heaven can't do anything on earth without the permission or access through those who God gave authority to. So if something is not happening in the earth, it's because we are not allowing it to happen. Is that clear? This is why, see, a lot of people say to me, but Pastor Miles, if God is sovereign, and he can do anything he wants to do, why pray? I mean, if you pray and God can do what he wants to do anyhow, then you might as well don't waste your time and pray. No, you see, if you don't understand the earth arrangement, you won't understand prayer. Prayer is constantly giving God permission to interfere in the earth because you're the one with the license. God could do anything, but he can only release what you allow. Can I hear an amen? amen. Understand this thou what I say? That is why Jesus said, listen to his words. Jesus said, you know, he's talking to the disciples now. He says, you know, you guys don't understand. He says, men ought always to pray. Now, listen to his words, ought. In other words, ought implies you all are stupid. You all don't understand that if you don't do this thing, nothing happens. He says, man ought always, who's talking? The one who set the system up. Man ought always to pray and never stop. You ain't supposed to go to a prayer meeting, my friend. You're supposed to be one. 
in the car, at the gas station, in the food store, in the bedroom, bathroom, in the back of the yard, in the office, on the construction job, in the plumbing job. God says, you better keep on praying if you want me to keep interfering. John Wesley said it this way. He said, prayer is strange. It seems as if without God, we cannot. And without us, God will not. We're stuck. So if you don't like the conditions on earth, then start making arrangements through prayer. Can I hear an amen? amen. Prayer is not this, you know, this, 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 ooh, spirit. Prayer is business. Hello? You're doing business with a government from whom you are the ambassador. And prayer is the medium through which you get your facts to come through. And your email. Prayer is how you get your, your, your flow of, 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 of information and, and resources to come from the government. And the invisible government of God has access through your faith to come into the planet through your authority that he gave you so he can impact earth from the unseen. You can change your week this week by understanding prayer. Everything Jesus did was a matter of kingdom. He understood rulership. So he gave the earth to man. My friends, the fall of man messed the whole program up. The fall of man was a fall not from heaven, but from dominion. Write that down. Man did not fall from heaven. Am I right? I mean, read your Bible. We didn't fall from heaven. So let me say, the fall, we keep thinking we fell from heaven. This is important to understand. Man did not fall from heaven. The record written by Moses is very clear. Man fell from his responsibility of dominion over the earth. Satan did not say, Eve, if you pick the fruit, you'll fall from heaven. She said, if you pick the fruit, you'll be like God. Stupid request. They were already like God. By the way, the greatest weapon against anybody is self-doubt. I'm going to repeat that again because that's a little heavy. The greatest weapon you can use against somebody is to make them doubt themselves. Self-doubt has in it low self-esteem, low self-concept, self-misconcept, low self-worth, low self-value, because you doubt yourself. When someone doubts themselves, they, be they believe they cannot do what they're capable of. Satan planted what I call the, the, the idea of self-hatred. That's why this ministry is so important. Our mission in the world is very clear. Let me tell you what our mission is. Our mission is to take a follower and make them think like a leader. Why? Because they are. But the conditioning from their past and their culture and their, and, and their environment have made them believe that they are not what they are. No member of this church should ever take a job without the idea that when this is over, I'll be in charge. You don't go and, listen, I'll never forget the meeting I had when I was in Malaysia. I went to a Sony company, and I was sitting down talking to a multi-millionaire group. I mean, about seven, eight of these guys, all millionaires, multi-millionaires. And we were chatting, and they were so happy to meet me because, you know, I was from the Bahamas, and, and my pigmentation was beautiful and everything, you know. And they were excited to have me there in Malaysia. And we were chatting over the meal. I was taking a break from the seminar, and one of them said to me, he said, do you know how I made my money? And he told me a story. I said, wow. He said, by the way, tell me this. Why do people of your pigmentation, any country we go into, we make money, but when we go there, we, don't, we see y'all you don't seem to quite break through. I said, I don't know. Tell me. He said, I finally figured it out. When I went to America, this guy, from, 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 he, he was from mainline China in Malaysia, working for the Sony company as a consultant. 
He said, when I went to America, I noticed all the cities I've been through, every time an Asian comes into the town, he ain't got nothing. But in a few months, he owned a business. And he says, well, your people of your beautiful pigmentation, they've been there for a thousand years. And they own nothing. Keep, looking, keep listening to me. Keep listening to me. They don't own nothing. He says, and I tried to figure it out. He said, because I know you all are hardworking people. He says, and after studying this for five or six years, I finally figured out. He says, you know, as I talk to your people, I finally figured out that we have different mentalities. Not abilities, mentalities. He said, the difference between us is, when we go into a city, we think differently. He said, for example, when you people go into any city, you go looking for a job. He says, Chinese never look for jobs. He said, when we go into a city, we go looking for a business. He says, even if we got a job, that ain't what we're looking for. We're just holding the job until we get the business. That's a good place to clap. You need to get that revelation. <laughs> See, it all boils down to what? The kingdom mentality. If you believe that you're supposed to follow all the time, then follow on. And believe me, there's enough folks in the world to lead you. I decided years ago in Baintown, age 14, I decided, mm -mm, rule, Britannia, rule Britannia ain't gonna rule this Britannia. <laughs> I determined years ago that ain't no queen was born to rule, born to rule over me. Ain't nobody born to rule over Miles. You ain't born, you can't be born good enough to rule over this good stuff. You ain't got what it takes. Only God could rule over this. Oh, I feel myself this morning. See, and Satan said to Eve, you are not like God. I'm coming here this morning to tell you and to tell you watching the television program that you are like God. God didn't make in the image of some dog or some monkey or some chimpanzee or any kind of these evolutionary ideas. He made you in his own. That's why I don't know. People say, you know, you all got a rich church. Mm -mm, we just got a rich word. And when the word hits us, we put on rich clothes. Hello, somebody. And even if we're on the bottom and we come here, we start looking up, moving up, striving up. Why? Because all of a sudden we realize, we realize who we are. We are just like our Father God. I used to be a Bahamian. I had to get delivered from my own country. I am not a Bahamian first. I got delivered. I'm a son of God first, who happened to live. I'm in the Bahamas, is blessed with the privilege of having me deposited on this little rock. And look what I'm doing with the rock, making it look a little better. Come on, praise the Lord, somebody. That's who you are. You ain't stuck into being a Bahamian. You are a child of God, a son of God, and you just happen to have a label that's gonna bless the Bahamas. Give the Lord another hand. You are somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah, brother. Don't you go to work tomorrow with your head down and your shoulders droop. I want you to walk for the rest of your life saying, good morning, everybody. Son just arrived, father upstairs, anybody need help? Yeah. Come on, praise him, somebody. Say amen. Yeah. Amen means let it be to me. Yeah. Boy, God says, my kingdom belongs to you. He gave us his kingdom over the earth. What an awesome responsibility. So no plant should rule your life. If you are smoking cigarettes, stop now. Don't let a leaf run your life, man. Don't do it. And you young people, 
Don't even let no one encourage you to let a cocoa leaf become your master. As a matter of fact, you ain't got to fight against <laughs> not taking drugs. That's below you. And it's supposed to be there, below you. You're supposed to dominate that stuff. Paul says, I will become mastered by nothing. I've seen people who had a good life, and then they started drinking. They call it social. <laughs> And they started smoking, and they call it peer pressure. And they started taking drugs, and they call it fitting in with a tragedy. Then there are those who are controlled by sex, lust. And some of you still fighting with that one. How can you be controlled by an industry when you're supposed to rule the world? Some people are controlled by their genitals. And it's dirt. And it gets quiet. <laughs> Take charge. Be the king. Even the king of your genitals. Oh, that's a good place to say amen. Y'all missed it. If someone say, let's go to bed and you ain't married, say, hold it a minute. I can't go to bed. Why? I'm a king. <laughs> what? I'm a king. So what's that got to do with going to bed? Well, I rule everything. What do you mean? I rule my panties and my drawers. <laughs> Look at me funny. <laughs> JC. <laughs> yeah. Boy, pastor, something else. Now I, we got to talk straight to these young people too. And the old people. I know that no member in this church, no member in this church comes here. I know that. I talk about other people in other churches. No member in this church comes here and says, I love you, Lord, and they sleeping around. I know that ain't happening. I know ain't no lesbian in here. I sure, guaranteed, ain't no homosexuals in here. I know that. Sure that. No question about it. Because we got kings in here. Does the Lord speak to you? Fix it. We are kings, man. Dominion. You know, I was thinking about this fall the other day. And the Lord said this to me, I wrote this down. He says, Adam didn't lose heaven, but a kingdom on earth. God said to me, he committed high treason and lost control of his rulership responsibilities on earth. That's what Adam did. Adam surrendered the management contract for earth to Satan. Adam abdicated his throne of dominion and rendered all men slaves to the employment of Satan. He who was supposed to have been deployed became employed. He who became, who was supposed to be ruler became the ruler. He was supposed to be the, the victor became the victim. He who became, who was the king became the subject. So when man disobeyed God's command, he lost not only sons, he also lost a kingdom on earth. God lost both. That's why when Jesus came, God in the flesh, he tried to explain what happened. 
to us. He had to use a story we could understand. So he said there was a father who had two sons. And one of them decided to go his own way, take what he wants, and go. And he ended up in a pig pen eating pig food. And one day he came to himself and, and said, my father is a king with servants. I will go back to my father and I will ask him, I know I've messed up, so just make me a servant. At least I'll be eating some good food. And I'll be at least in the house. But let me be a servant. But isn't it great? Jesus' story is right on. He says, but when he came, as soon as he saw him down the road, he didn't reach home yet. The father took off running and grabbed him and kissed him and said, my son who was lost is now found. And before the son could even explain where he'd been, and that's how God treats all of us, he don't want to hear about who you sleep with, what you drink, what you smoke, anything. He said, look, I just have to, you come, 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 come. I'm so glad you're home. He says, kill the fatted calf, get the ring, get the rope, get the shoes, let's have a party, party. He said, let's get down. Why? My son who was lost. God is, God is so excited that his son came home. The problem is we have accepted the contract that the son wanted. Not the one the father gave him. We want to be servants of the Lord. That's what a Christian is. A servant of the Lord. Christ says, I call you no longer servants, but what? Friends. Why? We're family. You know, Christ is your savior by, by circumstance. But your brother by natural genealogy. Kind of heavy. We understand him and admire him and we embrace him more as savior than as big brother. He is your big brother. You were made in his image and he is the first begotten of the father he's the first sample and all of us are made in his image so he is our big brother that's why in hebrews chapter one it says that chapter two rather it says that he who is the son also doesn't think it weird or strange to call us brethren because we're family that boy wanted to be less than family. He wanted to be a servant. His mentality was still damaged in the pig pen. He came from an environment where he couldn't believe that he could become a son again. I've come to shout the news to every one of the six billion people watching and listening, wherever you are, that you are a son. You know, if you're lost and you're my child, you're still my child. The loss doesn't cancel that. And so it is with every single human. That's why the kingdom gospel is good news. It's good news because it is a, a message sent by daddy to all the children telling them that they can come back into the kingdom and be sons again in their full right. That's why the first thing Christ asked for was not a robe. He didn't ask for, for the shoe first. He asked for the ring. Because the ring was the symbol of sonship and authority in the family. And if you're a son, then what? Then the robe is yours. And naturally, the clothes, all the closet is yours. And then all the food, the calf, everything is yours. Get, you got to get the ring figured out. And that's what Christ came to do. Christ came to put a ring on everybody's finger. Just put it back on. So everybody's back in, in fellowship with the Father. And let's get on with the house. Today, 
Paul stirs my heart in Romans 12. And I want to wrap up with this. We can pick up here next week. Paul says this in 12 verse 2. He says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Who was he talking to? He was talking to Christians. Yes, believers like you all. Hmm. <laughs> he said, look, even though you're born again, even though you're saved, you got a mental problem. He says, you got the Holy Spirit, but you don't have the spirit of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you got the anointing, but you ain't got the spirit of the anointing. And I'm talking to myself too. I had to fight with this. I, I was a Christian and I was complaining about Christianity. Anybody do that? I say, man, yeah, I love God and everything, but boy, why is so life so terrible? I thought God was a good God. Why is everything bad happening to me? Why can't I make it in life? I mean, all these wicked people moving ahead, taking everything that belongs to me, and I'm praying and believing and fasting all day, and I ain't got nothing. God, what's wrong here? God said, ain't nothing wrong with them wicked people. They're just your sons and daughters who don't know the, the father yet. Something wrong with you, even though you're saved. What's wrong with you is you say, but you're mentally damaged. So Paul is writing this to the Christians, and in verse 1 he says what? I beg you. Oh, the word beseech. Look at the word there. Beseech he means I beg you. Paul was begging them. Paul says, I beg you to present your body as a living sacrifice. Put your body under management. Stop drinking and stealing and smoking and lying and all the drugs. He said, well, manage your body first. Get that in order. Why? Because that's your legal house. If you lose that, then you can't do what's coming next. You can't serve God if you've got to keep puffing on a bunch of smoke. You can't fulfill a big ministry or build a big business if by 30 you sick and got cancer in your lungs. I beseech you, brethren, to bring your body under management. Bring your body under control and make it a living sacrifice. Man, this is tough. You know, a sacrifice is usually when they took the lamb and they tied up its leg and put it on the top and the lamb is kicking and kicking and then they do something to help him out. They cut its throat and the blood comes out. They catch the blood and they take it into the, to, to, to the altar but the lamb is burned up or cut up and then burned and the lamb is a dead sacrifice. Paul says, no. He said, the, see, we can't tie up and kill you, so you got to be a living one. Yeah. When your body want to go back into something, he said, take your body and come here. See, you can't cut it off and kill it, so you got to keep it. Bring it under control, see? Don't call your old boyfriend no more. You know him, good for you. Cut that thing off. Yes. And stop sleeping with your ex-husband and your ex-wife because they done married. Again, bring your body under subjection. Shut down them pornographic videos. Burn them up, shut that life off. Bring your body under subjection. Don't let no boy touch your breasts and no girl touch your genitals, brother. You bring your body as a living sacrifice. Look, I got to keep my body pure. And I'm telling you, friends, God could see everything. Why am I going here? I don't understand this this morning. God can't bless you if you're shacking up and doing stuff with your body. He said, bring your body under subjection. Today is the 28th day of, no, of January. Fix it today. Clean it today. Stop it today. Make a decision today to live clean in your body. Make a phone call. Call it off and shut it down. Tell them don't come back no more. Do something. Amen. Fix it. Bring your body as a living sacrifice. And then he says, be no longer conformed to this world's way of thinking. But be ye what? Transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. See, we've got to learn to think again like kings. Kings. We must have the spirit of kingship. 
attitude of kingship. And that's why the whole thing about Christianity, as you call it, is really about leadership. It's about rulership. It's about kingship. It's not about low and humble and poor and all that stuff. It's about taking over again. Let me, let me close with a verse that I thought was very interesting. This verse found in, in uh, Matthew. We can, we can deal with this next week. Tell your neighbor, boy, that pompous pastor preaching good. I preaching good. I preaching good. Praise God. I preaching to myself. Hallelujah. Matthew 25. Watch this. Woo, I love this verse. Love this verse. Matthew 25. Everybody got it? Come on. Everybody turn there. I want you to read this for yourself. This is deep stuff. Matthew chapter 25. Jesus is explaining to the people how this whole thing's supposed to end. And he says to them in chapter 25 of Matthew, let's read verse 34. The king, oh, I like that. Woo. He said the king. Yeah, hallelujah. The king. The king, praise the Lord. Let's read verse 31. Get a context. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, everybody say glory. glory. What is glory? Full weight. Boy, that's a deep statement. Now you can see, understand it now, right? Yeah, isn't that great? When the Son of Man comes in what? His full weight. See, y'all didn't see nothing yet, he says. But when he comes in his full weight, all the angels with him, he will sit on what? His throne. Last time he saw him, he was on a cross, bleeding. That wasn't his full weight. That wasn't the real thing. He coming as a king on a throne in heavenly what? Full weight. That means heaven going to show its full weight. Wow. All the nations will be gathered together, including the Bahamas, Jamaica, Barbados, America, Canada, England, Argentina, Chile, Swaziland, Namibia. He said, I'm going to bring all, my Lord, every nation can be gathered unto me. Watch this. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now, it didn't say we were sheep and goats. Hmm. It says the way the shepherd does that is the way he's going to do that. Now, do you know how shepherds separate sheep from goats? Let me tell you how he does it. When you go to, to, uh, to the to land of Israel, we've been there many times now, they, got this, they still got farms there just like they did in the day of Jesus, and they got many shepherds all over the place. You see them all over the place with sheep following them. And they got goats as well. Now, the way you separate a sheep from a goat is this way. Watch this. When the sheep and goats go out to graze, the shepherd take all of them together. And they are always mingling together, eating, the, eating the, the, the grass. So they're all together. When they get back to the home, to the farm, they got the big pens to put these animals, fences and so forth. And so the shepherd does something. He stands in the front of the mass of sheep and goats. And he doesn't go through taking them one by one but that would take 10 years. You know how goats got some interesting attitudes? <laughs> how does a shepherd separate a sheep from a goat? He stands at the head of the whole flock of sheep and goats, and he makes a sound. He said, that's how I'm going to do it. It's going to be done with a sound. The sheep, now, tell you something about goat now. Goats don't follow sound. <laughs> Y'all listen, man. Jesus made sheep, you know, and he made goats, and he knew them two animals. Sheep don't, I mean, goats don't follow sound. You got to drive goats. But sheep, you don't got to drive. You make the sound, beep, beep, and they know their master's voice. They know the sound he makes. And when they hear that sound, they stop eating and they go toward the sound. And wherever the sound goes, they go. Now one day, we were in a kibbutz on a farm. Uh, the, the sheep came down with the shepherd, 
walking. And it was a beautiful scene. My wife and I were shocked. The beautiful scene the shepherd just go to me. We saw what we saw paintings of. It's real. The shepherd walking. And he and they looking back. And the sheep on a straight line, all of them walking right behind him in the Holy Land. I said, my God, there's a postcard. <laughs> and he came right near to us because we were standing there with Ben Kinchlow and other people. We were all admiring the sunset in Bethlehem. And the shepherd came right by. And guess what? All the while he was walking, he's making a sound. Never look back. And it was the sound of that specific shepherd for those specific groups of sheep. Christ says, when I do this thing, I'm going to make sounds. Man, you don't talk to me. See, all y'all sitting together, I know who's go. All y'all ain't hearing my voice. Everybody, right there, nod. He says here, then the king will, will separate them with a sound like the man separates sheep from a goat. Ah, and then the king will say to those on his right, read out loud, please. Come, you who are blessed by my who? Father, take your inheritance. That means your right. The kingdom which was prepared for you before the world. Stand up on your feet and shout, somebody. If you can hear his voice, bless him with a praise offering this morning. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.